Um, now we're going to hear from Shauna Diedrichs. She is site conservator at Woods Canyon Archaeological Consultants, which is located in Pleasant View, Colorado. Uh, Wanda Rashkow um, from uh, Friends of Cedar Mesa will show her presentation today. Thank you for helping us, Wanda. You bet, Beth. Um, I want to say a little bit about this video. Shauna does a great job of introducing herself, but this project that she's discussing would normally have been a volunteer project where stewards like yourselves and other volunteers could have participated in the pro project. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we weren't allowed to use volunteers. But these are the types of things you should keep your eyes out for and watch and see if you can get involved in them. So let me turn it over to Shauna. Hello, my name is Shauna Diedrichs. I'm a site conservator at Woods Canyon Archaeological Consultants. It's wonderful to be here with you all, even if it's in a very virtual form. Um, today I'm going to talk about impacts to archaeological sites in southeast Utah using one site as, as an example and um, a World Monuments Fund project that we're involved with that is both documenting the condition um, of sites, uh, tracing the visitor impacts uh, that are occurring, and in some cases implementing conservation uh, treatments to sites. So let me go ahead and share my screen here. Okay. Um, so if any of you have visited Bears Ears National Monument uh, area in the past in Southeast Utah, uh, you know that there are incredible uh, cliff dwellings in the canyons uh, that have really been driving um, backcountry visitation for generations. Um, recently, uh, with the creation of Bears Ears National Monument by the Obama administration and the recent reduction by the Trump administration, the area has been put on the map by the media. And this has really created um, an unprecedented volume of visitors uh, uh, to the region. Um, visitor impacts, of course, have been going on for a long time and they've been increasing over probably the last 30 years. Uh, this is really driven by um, the internet and location data. Um, uh, so backcountry sites where people just wouldn't have, have made their way to uh, without uh, being intrepid uh, backpackers are now pretty regular, um, regu regular destinations. As you can see from this visitation trend graph uh, put together by Friends of Cedar Mesa, um, there are uh, exponential uh, numbers of, of folks visiting uh, the region. Um, and yes, that growth happened before the monuments um, creation, but it's really, it's really been uh, increasing at a dramatic pace over the last four years. So two years ago, the region was put on the World Monuments uh, fund watch list of endangered places, and this was based on reports of increasing damage to its cultural landscape uh, by uh, large numbers of, of visitors. Uh, so under a project funded by the World Monuments Fund, um, an associated fund called the Butler Conservation Fund, and Friends of Cedar Mesa, uh, we have been tracking visitor impacts, um, looking at safety at sites, uh, and assessing the condition and implementing conservation um, uh, at certain sites in Southeast Utah. So I'm gonna use this site as our example, and I'm just gonna call it the site, uh, just not to do my part, not to add uh, fuel to the fire about uh, backcountry destinations. So as you can see, it's, it's um, not a multi-story cliff dwelling, but uh, pretty diminutive. Um, we've got several intact structures on the site, which, which is incredible. Um, there was almost nothing known about this place before we got to it in 2019. This is the site form uh, map. So it was 
It was um, uh, mapped with binoculars in 1963, and the map was drawn from memory. Uh, that is the only management documentation that was on file. So, you know, these are incredible resources with very little uh, um, archaeological management tools um, to uh, take care of them with. That doesn't mean that the site wasn't wasn't a destination for visitors. Um, you know, it was definitely sought out by backpackers up and down certain canyon systems, uh, at least for 30 years. A friend of mine passed on these photographs and gave me a little information about, you know, a visit that he had made in 1983. And he remembers that there was very little foot traffic at this site. There was hundreds of artifacts covering the surface. And you can see from this photo that many of those were perishables, including basketry material, uh, feather twined blankets, uh, quids, um, sandal fragments. So just an incredible um, uh, intact uh, assemblage sitting on the surface itself. And there were uh, several of the structures that were standing and they were incredibly stable. So it was in, in pristine condition um, as late as 1983. What our condition assessment in 2019 found was that it was, uh, it has been uh, hit very hard over the last several decades. The foot traffic is probably the biggest danger to the site. Not only are there multiple trails up the min deposits and cultural deposits in front of the, uh, the alcove, but the foot traffic was so bad that it had undermined at least four different structures on their downhill side, which was causing critical um, instability. So we've got leans, cracks, bulges in the in the masonry, along with major holes uh, in the walls that people were expanding in order to climb inside the kivas. And there just was very few artifacts on site. In fact, these few ceramics are about what we could find. So uh, based on our condition assessment, we decided to um, put forth a preservation proposal. So we take conservation very seriously and we definitely uh, see it as um, the final uh, and last option uh, for a site. Uh, we do not want to um, impact the, you know, the original materials at a place if we don't have to. But our, our philosophy at Woods Canyon is that we really depend on extensive documentation to show you what we've done. We use only nat natural materials in an ancestral construction uh, method style. All those treatments are reversible and they focus on changing uh, visitor behavior. So we took this plan and we uh, actually took it to the cultural resource advisory teams at Hopi, Zuni, Acoma, and Laguna. Um, and this is because both World Monuments and Friends of Cedar Mesa are um, extending tribal engagement uh, uh, in this project beyond regular um, government to government consultation. So we really want to bring people out to these places uh, eventually. Uh, we got some input and you know, there was a lot of differences, but the few things that they did agree on was that they were very concerned about visitor impacts. Um, they saw these uh, impacts as unnatural. So they're not the regular life cycle of a site that um, uh, should just be left alone. Uh, the kivas, they all agreed that those kivas should be closed where people are climbing in, in uh, out of uh, those intact buildings. And uh, there was overall support for our, our conservation project. So we decided, um, because we were going to Im implement preservation on a uh, intact and untouched um, backcountry site that we had to conduct some documentation. And that involved mapping, photos, 3D modeling, um, and uh, uh, roof documentation and plaster documentation. So I'll, I'll, I'll just show you some examples of those real quick. Um, what we found is that the site really consists of, of four kivas. 
uh, and those are features four, one through four on the map there. Uh, there are also three corn grinding rooms, um, five walled open areas, and some rock art. What there was not at this site was above ground habitation rooms. Uh, so it wasn't a permanent year round habitation, but was likely a communal space that was used for this for the by the surrounding settlement that is both um, that can be found up and down the same canyon system. Uh, here's just a screenshot of our 3D models of of all the buildings. Uh, we mapped and like I said, tree ring cord the uh, intact uh, roof systems. And um, it, some of the results from that mapping turned out fairly interesting. Uh, the kivas from, from the uh, outside look very similar. They're round structures with the uh, roof sort of masonry lined and at the same level as the surrounding plaza. And they would have been accessed by the roof through a rectangular hatch. Once you get inside and look at those roofing systems, they look absolutely different. We've got our West Kiva, which is supported by just two pilasters or masonry pillars by a major Vega, and then these sort of clustered pattern secondary beams. And then we have the East Kiva, which is a little bit more standard with four uh, supporting pilasters and a cribbed uh, roof system. We also uh, documented and mapped the interior faces of, of both structures, including their plaster. Um, the kivas also differed in that way, in which one of them was plastered with red uh, plaster and the other one with white plaster. And once we started really looking at those surfaces, we realized that there was incised designs, very, very subtle. Um, so these are some enhanced, uh, uh, photographs of those designs. Um, and based on what we know from uh, surrounding research in southwest uh, eastern Utah, uh, we think that these inscribed, incised geometric designs um, really imply that people were using those structures for textile production. So incised line and drill hole designs on the walls of, uh, of kivas like this are really a regional Pueblo III period, which is 1100s and 1200s um, AD, uh, textile imagery uh, tradition. So similar designs have been documented at more than a dozen sites in canyon systems adjacent to this one. Um, and these mural traditions coincide with the rise of cotton farming in Southeast Utah, the adoption of the vertical loom and intensive textile production, um, which was really used as a uh, export uh, during by ancestral Pueblo people. So you can see the West Kiva had more finished um, uh, sort of designs, which are probably actual tapestry depictions, while the East Kiva, you can see more banded and zigzag designs. Uh, they really um, look like they're depicting the weaving uh, process um, with warp and weft relationships and sort of mnemonic counting devices on the on the walls. So these are, are elements that are used to actual actually help people in their textile uh, production. So once we've done all that documentation, we went straight into sort of a conservation uh, process. Uh, as you can see from this map, we did everything from dry lay masonry, <clears throat> excuse me, wet lay uh, stabilization, brought in tons of, of fill, uh, probably four tons of fill, and we closed uh, trail systems and we built a new established trail. So quick example of, of those, you can see we sealed those holes in the kivas with masonry. Um, we brought in, all that fill. Uh, on the right, you can see a plaza that was plastered over and we actually coated it in uh, about 10 centimeters of backfill. And we closed lots of routes and uh, built trails. And you can see that we use the Ancestral Lands Corps, which is a Southwest Conservation Corps um, team. And this uh, group down in the 
uh, bottom right uh, photo is from Zuni. So we're trying to bring um, tribal folks, uh, young tribal folks into the process too. So what I want to end on is that, um, again, you know, conservation and treatment uh, uh, implementation is really the last effort that we should make at a site. We should not be impacting these places if at all uh, possible. So we can't use this as just constant mitigation for visitor impacts. What we really need is a paradigm shift when it comes to um, all of us uh, visiting archaeological sites. So, you know, the questions I want to pose is, do we really need to enter every site? <clears throat> Can we explore it from a distance? Do we need to look in every nick and corner when, when we do get into an archaeological site? <clears throat> Should we even touch artifacts at all, um, much less be moving them around into collector's piles? Do we need the perfect picture? And do we need to share that on social media, especially when it comes to um, uh, it giving away location information or having embedded location information? Um, in short, are we visiting these places with respect? And maybe we need to uh, uh, digest that a little bit. And I'm hoping that this conference will be uh, help us walk away with a better perspective on what respect means for archaeological sites. So I just want to say thank you again for having me. Um, you know, we've got uh, many partners that made this happen, including Friends of Cedar Mesa, World Monuments Fund, um, Southwest Conservation Corps, Living Heritage Anthropology, and the State of Utah Institutional Trust Lands and Administration. Have a wonderful conference, everyone. Um, question that I had was she talked about um, visit with respect. Uh, perhaps you might want, I know yesterday you mentioned that, but maybe you want to uh, refer to that program that Cedar uh, Mesa has. A visit with respect program is similar to site stewardship. There is overlap between the two programs. When I talked yesterday about our stewardship program having an ambassador level, well, with Visit With Respect, we train people to be Visit With Respect ambassadors. And so they visit areas, they do hikes through areas rather than concentrating on documenting the archaeological sites. And they are taught to engage with the public. And if you want to know what the Visit With Respect kind of rules are, you can visit our friends of Cedar Mesa .org, um, website and the visit with respect program is highlighted there. But we try to teach people things like don't climb on the walls, don't pick up the artifacts and move them to put them on display in a group. Keep your children from crawling on the walls, keep your animals, you know, tie your dogs up outside of an archaeological site. Don't eat lunch in the site. So there's a whole list of things that are intended to help protect those sites. And one of the things that Shauna brought up is that in our engagement with tribal people, they do believe that sites should be allowed to go through their natural life cycle, that the sites will eventually degrade back to the earth. And so they, they aren't necessarily in favor of doing big stabilization projects, but they will support conservation that undoes visitor impacts. Thank you, Wanda. I think that's a good distinction for all of us to better understand on uh, conservation.